Now that we've discussed the biochemical makeup of cells, we're ready to turn our attention to the organized structures of cells, and we can start delving more deeply into important aspects of cellular function. But before we do, it's useful to consider life on Earth from a broad perspective to understand the evolutionary context in which all cellular life developed and persists. The Earth itself is about 4.6 billion years old, and researchers use a variety of microfossil, geological, and radiometric dating techniques to reconstruct a likely timeline for the evolution of cellular life. And based on this sort of evidence, it's pretty clear that simple cells were present at least 3.8 billion years ago, and perhaps as early as 4.1 billion years ago. These cells would have had very simple cellular structures, what we would classify as prokaryotic cells, lacking internal compartments such as the nucleus. Now obviously the Earth was a very different place at that time. It was hot, inhospitable with an atmosphere made up of various volcanic outgases like hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, etc. And the earliest cellular life would have evolved under these conditions. They would have been obligate anaerobes, living in the absence of oxygen, and would have derived their energy to synthesize biomolecules from oxidizing inorganic substances, things like iron, elemental sulfur, ammonia. It's thought that around 3.5 billion years ago, the innovation of capturing and using sunlight energy arose. Initially, this earliest photosynthesis utilized electron donors such as hydrogen sulfide rather than water, and so did not produce molecular oxygen. So it's referred to as anoxygenic photosynthesis. But around 3 billion years ago, there was a shift to oxygenic photosynthesis carried out by the cyanobacteria. This ultimately led to an increase in the concentration of molecular oxygen in the atmosphere, and this was important for a number of reasons, but I'll just mention two. First, oxygen was toxic to the vast majority of anaerobic life that existed at that time, and so it led to a global mass extinction event, as well as the selection of new aerobic species capable of surviving those conditions. But it also led to the presence of ozone in the atmosphere, which blocks ultraviolet radiation and reduced UV levels at the surface to levels that would eventually allow organisms to emerge out of the oceans and ultimately led to the evolution of land, plants, and animals. By about 2.8 billion years ago, the evidence suggests that some organisms had emerged that could not only survive in the presence of oxygen, but could actually use its oxidizing power to obtain energy. And these were the aerobic prokaryotes. It's not until around 1.8 billion years ago that complex cells emerged, referred to as eukaryotic cells, much larger than the prokaryotes with extensive internal compartmentalization and specialization. And multicellular life really only began to emerge around 800 million years ago. So for the vast majority of Earth's history, billions of years of it, life on Earth was exclusively made up of single-celled prokaryotic microbes, and the number of these prokaryotic species still around today vastly, vastly outnumbers the number of eukaryotic species. On the left is a phylogenetic tree that was created through the analysis and comparison of completed genome sequences from thousands of prokaryotic and eukaryotic species. It illustrates the evolutionary lineages which have produced all life on Earth, beginning with a last universal common ancestor, Luca, thought to have existed around 3.5 billion years ago here at the center. And it illustrates the classification of cellular life into three domains, two of which, the archaea and bacteria, are prokaryotic cells, and the third being eukarya, highlighted in pink which encompasses animals, plants, algae, fungi, and protists. Here on the left, highlighted in green, are the prokaryotic archaea, and in purple, the prokaryotic bacteria, which vastly outnumbers the other two. The three-domain classification scheme is relatively recent. Before the 1990s, life was classified into two empires, prokarya and eukarya, under which came the five kingdoms, Bacteria, fungi, protists, plants, and animals. And archaea were thought to be just weird bacteria, extremophiles, that lived and thrived in harsh environments with extreme temperatures or acidic pH or high salinity, which is where they were first identified. And after all, if you compare their physical forms, they seem to be structurally similar simple prokaryotes. 
But analysis at the molecular level revealed that the archaea are distinct. They share some characteristics in common with both the bacteria and the eukaryotes, but they also have some unique characteristics that are found in neither. Here we're looking at a comparison of the structure of 16S ribosomal RNA, which is an important component of the ribosome. Looking at these secondary structures, you can definitely pick out similarities, but also distinctions. And detailed analysis of these nucleic acid sequences revealed that the archaea were genetically distinct organisms from the bacteria. Other bits of molecular evidence included the fact that the molecular machinery they used to copy DNA to RNA is more similar to that found in eukaryotic cells. The cell walls of archaea have a different composition from bacterial cells, and their cellular membranes have phospholipids with many unique features not found in either bacteria or eukaryotes. For example, they use the opposite enantiomer of glycerol to build their phospholipids than that used by bacteria and archaea, and some of their phospholipids are actually two-headed molecules that pass all the way through the bilayer. The list could go on, but the basic idea here is that based on molecular criteria rather than superficial physical criteria, all life forms are classified as belonging to one of these three domains. The bacteria, consisting of broadly distributed single-celled microbes, the archaea, also prokaryotic, less broadly distributed and capable of thriving in some of the most extreme environments on the planet, and the eukaryotes, which encompasses both single-celled and multicellular life forms among the fungi, protists, animals, and plants. We're just going to get a brief overview of commonly observed structural features of prokaryotic cells, and we'll spend most of our time on the com more complex eukaryotic cells, but I strongly urge you to take a microbiology class. Even if it's not required by your educational plan, you will be amazed by the structural and metabolic diversity of bacterial and archaeal species. So let's take a look at the general structure of a prokaryotic cell. Here we're looking at a cartoon representation of a typical rod-shaped prokaryotic cell, such as E. coli found in your gut. Other common shapes for prokaryotic cells are round or spiral-shaped, as shown here on the left. A defining characteristic of prokaryotic cells is their lack of internal compartmentalization. In other words, there are no membrane-enclosed subcellular domains. Like all cells, they have a cellular or plasma membrane, but inside that is one common aqueous cytoplasm. Prokaryotic cells typically have one circular DNA molecule, or chromosome, containing the main cellular genome. As we've discussed before, this DNA will be compacted through supercoiling, and the region of the cytoplasm containing the DNA is referred to as the nucleoid. In addition to this main chromosome, most prokaryotes will have small extra-chromosomal DNA molecules, also circular, called plasmids. These contain non-essential genes that may be useful under some conditions, antibiotic resistance genes, for example. Prokaryotic cells have mechanisms to swap these extra-chromosomal plasmids even among different species, which is one reason that antibiotic resistance tends to spread so easily among different species. Ribosomes would be present in the cytoplasm, and like in all cells, would be composed of two subunits, each of which is a complex containing several ribosomal RNA molecules, and dozens of individual polypeptides. Prokaryotic ribosomes, though similar in structure to eukaryotic ribosomes, are smaller in size and are referred to as 70S ribosomes. S stands for Svedberg unit. It measures the rate of sedimentation under centrifugal force. The smaller the size of the molecule, the slower the rate. Whereas eukaryotic ribosomes are 80S. All other important cellular biomolecules would also exist within this common cytoplasmic soup. Amino acids, tRNAs, cellular enzymes, and so on. Outside of the plasma membrane, we would likely find a cell wall to provide structural support to the cell. This cell wall consists of a matrix of protein and carbohydrate called peptidoglycan. Outside of this, many prokaryotes secrete an additional slimy layer of carbohydrate molecules that form a slimy capsule. This capsule provides protection against immune rec recognition in some pathogenic organisms, and so it can be associated with virulence or ability to cause disease. 
Many prokaryotes contain numerous finger-like protein projections on their surface called fimbriae that enable them to adhere to surfaces, to one another, and to host cells. So these are also associated with the ability to cause disease in pathogenic species. Finally, many prokaryotes are capable of locomotion. They swim through their environment propelled by the rotation of one or more flagella. Helical tail-like protein complexes connected to membrane-embedded motors that rotate, powered by cellular ATP. You can see both the fimbriae and flagella of Salmonella in this electron micrograph down here at the right. Now again, this is a very brief overview of the commonly observed cellular structures and features, but there's an incredible level of diversity among the millions of distinct prokaryotic species, and you should really take a microbiology class to learn more about them. For the rest of this video, though, we're going to turn our attention to the more structurally and functionally complex eukaryotic cells, such as we might find making up the unicellular fungi and protists, as well as multicellular plants and animals. What we're looking at here is a cartoon representation of a so-called typical animal cell, highlighting commonly observed features of all or nearly all eukaryotic cells. In a moment, we'll talk about some sp specific features found in other eukaryotic cells, plants, protists, and fungi. The first thing that we notice immediately is that the structure of the eukaryotic cell is more complex than that of the prokaryotic bacteria or archaea. There are numerous membrane-enclosed subcellular compartments called organelles, each of which has its own specialized function to contribute. This is analogous to the way that distinct organs and organ systems contribute to the function of a multicellular organism like an animal, hence the name organelle, or little organ. We'll talk about them in a moment, but before we do, I want to point out similarities that exist between all cells, regardless of whether they're simple prokaryotes or more complex eukaryotes. All cells are made up of protein, carbohydrate, lipid, and nucleic acid. All cells are bounded by a cellular membrane made up of a backbone phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins, which serves as a barrier allowing regulated transport. All cells use DNA as their heritable material. All cells contain ribosomes that enable protein synthesis to occur. All cells utilize enzymes, biological catalysts, to speed up chemical reactions that are necessary for life. All cells have an aqueous gel-like cytoplasm in which all this stuff is suspended and interacting. So lots of commonalities reflecting our shared evolutionary heritage. But what's distinct about eukaryotic cells is this extensive compartmentalization and specialization of function. So let's turn our attention to these organelles in order to better understand what they do. Let's start with what's typically the largest organelle, the nucleus. The nucleus is the organelle where DNA is stored, organized, and regulated. It's bounded by a double membrane, by which I mean two separate phospholipid bilayers, not just one. This double membrane is referred to as the nuclear envelope, and transport of materials into and out of the nucleus is regulated by thousands of nuclear pores that span the envelope. Outside of the nucleus is a convoluted membrane-enclosed compartment called the endoplasmic reticulum, which can be subdivided into two types, rough endoplasmic reticulum, or rough ER, so-called because its surface is studded with ribosomes, and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which lacks ribosomes. Just based on the fact that ribosomes are found in association with the rough ER, you might suspect that it plays some role in protein synthesis, and you'd be right. Specifically, proteins that are membrane-embedded, or destined for specific cellular organelles, or destined to be secreted from the cell, are synthesized at the rough ER, whereas general cytoplasmic proteins would be synthesized by free ribosomes in the cytoplasm. We'll look into the details of this more in a minute. So if smooth ER isn't involved in protein synthesis, what does it do? Smooth ER contains enzymes that synthesize lipids, things like membrane phospholipids and cholesterol, and the steroid hormones derived from cholesterol. In some cell types, smooth ER takes on additional specialized functions as well. It stores calcium, which can be released in regulated fashion under stimulation. We already saw an example of how this is involved in muscle cell contraction. And in liver cells, detoxification enzymes are held in smooth ER. 
and this organelle is therefore critically important for the ability of the liver to break down or chemically modify potentially harmful substances in the body. The Golgi complex, or Golgi apparatus, consists of a set of flattened membrane-enclosed compartments called cisternae. And the Golgi contains enzymes that catalyze carbohydrate synthesis and carbohydrate modification of proteins and lipids, which we learned earlier in the course is called glycosylation. The nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, and the plasma membrane are all considered to be part of an interconnected system called the endomembrane system. Membranes are membrane-enclosed compartments that are either physically contiguous with one another or that send and receive materials among themselves through the use of membrane-enclosed vesicles. What do I mean by physically contiguous? Well, if we look at the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope and the endoplasmic reticulum, this is all one continuous connected membrane compartment with specialized functional regions. It's not really separate compartments. The Golgi is separate from this system, but communicates with it and with the plasma membrane by means of vesicles which can break off from one compartment as little membrane-enclosed spheres and fuse with another membrane-enclosed compartment to deliver its contents. We'll talk more about trafficking through the endomembrane system in a bit, but let's look at the other organelles and cellular structures first. Mitochondria are commonly depicted as little kidney bean-shaped structures, though as we'll see in class, that's not really accurate. They also are bounded by a double membrane consisting of two phospholipid bilayers. Mitochondria are the sites of the vast majority of ATP synthesis in eukaryotic cells, so they are commonly referred to as the powerhouses of the cell. We'll investigate this metabolic function in a lot more detail in a couple of weeks when we talk about cellular respiration. The centrosome is an organizing center that is involved with controlling changes in the structure of the cytoskeleton, particularly the microtubule network. It consists of two bundles of microtubules called centrioles. Its function is a bit of a mystery. Plant cells lack centrosomes, but still are capable of organizing and reorganizing their microtubule networks. We'll talk more about the types of proteins that make up the cytoskeleton in a moment. Endosomes are similar to vesicles in that they are membrane-enclosed compartments that transport and sort materials to specific cellular locations, from the Golgi complex or the plasma membrane to the lysosome, for example. The lysosome is an organelle that contains hydrolytic enzymes that degrade macromolecules via hydrolysis reactions. It enables recycling of worn-out organelles and is also responsible for digesting or breaking down ingested material that the cell has taken in from its environment. So it's sort of like the stomach of the cell. And like the stomach, the lysosome has an acidic pH that aids in denaturing and degrading macromolecules. All of these organelles just discussed, the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, mitochondria, would be found in all or nearly all eukaryotic cells. But some organisms commonly have additional cell structures and organelles that animal cells lack. For example, cell walls. As we've discussed previously, both plants and fungi will have cell walls for structural support, in addition to and outside of the cellular membrane. In plants, it's primarily composed of cellulose. In fungi, it's chitin. In photosynthetic organisms like land plants and algae, chloroplasts will be found. These are the organelles in which sunlight energy is captured and used to synthesize organic compounds like sugars, producing oxygen as a waste product. And in plant cells and protozoa, very commonly a large membrane-enclosed watery compartment called the central vacuole will be found. This compartment has various specialized roles depending on cell type. It's used for everything from controlling water balance in the cell, storing waste products away from the cytoplasm, housing hydrolase enzymes, and so on. But as you can see, most of the cellular structures and organelles are actually in common among all eukaryotes. Now that we have a general overview of what a eukaryotic cell looks like and what its major organelles are, I want to spend some time talking about some of them in a bit more detail, starting with the nucleus. 
The function of the nucleus is commonly presented as storing and protecting the DNA from potentially damaging or harmful substances or processes occurring in the cytoplasm, and it does that, but it also does so much more. We first need to understand that the DNA is not just randomly smushed into the nucleus. It's actually highly organized into specific subnuclear domains, and this organization and regulation is critically important for normal expression of the genetic instructions in the DNA. Genes that are copied at high levels tend to be localized together in regions where the molecular machinery responsible for that copying are also localized. Genes that aren't copied much would be found in other domains. You can actually observe this domain structure using simple light microscopy by adding a dye that binds to nucleic acid, as we see in this light microscopy image. As expected, we see staining of the nucleus. But within the nucleus, there's a darker staining region called the nucleolus. This is the domain of the nucleus where hundreds of copies of ribosomal RNA genes are localized and copied at high levels. Since there's so much ribosomal RNA here, this nuclear region stains a darker purple. This is also the site where ribosomes are assembled before being transported out of the nucleus. The same type of domain organization is maintained for the other genes in the genome as well. There are many proteins that contribute to this organization. Among these are proteins of the nuclear lamina. The nuclear lamina is a network of proteins that line the inner membrane of the nucleus and that interact with the chromatin fibers of DNA to organize its nuclear localization and the overall architecture of the nucleus. The importance of these proteins in regulating cellular function is revealed by the very rare clinical syndrome, hutchinson gilford progeria syndrome, which is a genetic disorder caused by a mutation in one of these nuclear lamina proteins called lamin A. In the fluorescence microscopy image on the right, you can see the disruption in the shape of the nucleus of a cell from an individual with this disorder compared to a control nucleus. Individuals with this disorder suffer from highly accelerated aging and typically die in their late teens or early 20s. They show classic physiological disorders associated with aging, including superficial things like hair loss and thinning of the skin, but also cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and other things like that. It's not clear exactly what causes the rapid aging, but molecular studies have shown that the disrupted nuclear architecture is correlated with the disruption in the normal expression of thousands of cellular genes. There are a number of labs investigating this disorder, not just to be able to help those rare individuals directly affected, but also because presumably understanding the molecular basis for this rapid aging disease will provide insight into disruptions in gene expression that might be associated with normal aging and its disorders. Until the late 1990s, the location of DNA in the nucleus was thought to be random. We now know that that's not the case. It's highly ordered, and that is critical for normal gene function. There are a lot of research labs working to understand the molecular details of this organization more fully. I'd like to spend a bit more time discussing the endomembrane system and its role in membrane and protein trafficking within the cell. As I said earlier, the rough ER is the site of protein synthesis for specific types of proteins, those that are destined to be secreted outside the cell, sent to a specific cellular organelle, like the lysosome, or that are embedded within membranes, say a cell surface receptor, for example. So how does this work? And how does the cell know the destination of a given protein? It turns out that this information is going to be encoded in the amino acid sequence of the protein itself. Let's look at a specific example to see how this would work. A hydrolase enzyme that is destined to reside in the lysosome compartment. The gene encoding this hydrolase would be housed in the nucleus, of course. As we've talked about before, the gene would be copied to mRNA, and that mRNA would then be transported out of the nucleus and would interact with a cytoplasmic ribosome to initiate the process of translation, or protein synthesis. The ribosome will move along the mRNA, and tRNA molecules will deliver the correct amino acids specified by the sequence of nucleotides in the mRNA, and the protein will begin to be assembled, exiting the ribosome through the top. Now, if this is a protein that is destined for the lysosome, 
or for the plasma membrane or to be secreted from the cell, the first 20 or so amino acids will act as a molecular signal that this protein has a specific destination and must be built in the rough ER in order to be transported to its destination correctly. After those 20 or so amino acids emerge from the ribosome, a protein RNA complex called the signal recognition particle will bind to the ribosome and cause protein synthesis to stop. The whole ribosome, mRNA, and protein complex will translocate to the rough ER membrane, where the ribosome will dock onto a pore in the membrane and then reinitiate translation in such a way that the newly synthesized protein will now be inserted within the interior of the rough ER. Once protein synthesis is complete, the ribosome releases and returns to the cytoplasm to bind a new mRNA. The finished protein will then be transported from the rough ER to the Golgi complex for further carbohydrate modification. To accomplish this, a vesicle pinches off from the rough ER membrane, carrying the protein within it. This vesicle then translocates to and fuses with the Golgi compartment closest to the ER, called the cis-Golgi. When the vesicle fuses with the Golgi membrane, the contents of the vesicle are now delivered to the interior of the Golgi cistern. Inside the Golgi, glycosylation enzymes recognize specific amino acid sequences in the hydrolase enzyme polypeptide and add the appropriate carbohydrate groups to the protein. In the case of hydrolase enzymes bound for the lysosome, it's a phosphorylated mannose sugar, or mannose 6-phosphate. This carbohydrate modification serves as the molecular signal that gets the hydrolase to its final destination. The hydrolase will dock onto a mannose 6-phosphate receptor protein in the Golgi membrane. This region of the trans-Golgi membrane will pinch off, forming a vesicle, and then translocate to the lysosome. Once the vesicle fuses to the lysosome membrane, the hydrolase is delivered to its destination. The mannose 6-phosphate glycosylation serves as a molecular zip code that tags the protein so that it can be sorted to its correct destination. But it's important to realize that it was the amino acid sequence of the hydrolase enzyme itself that directed the mannose 6-phosphate modification. The same essential steps would be followed by a protein that was destined to be secreted from the cell, say a collagen protein destined for the extracellular matrix outside the cell, it would also be synthesized in rough ER and transported to the Golgi via vesicle, but it would have a different modification added that would direct it to the cell surface instead of the lysosome. So vesicles ship cargo between components of the endomembrane system, but they are also the means by which membrane lipids are transported from their site of synthesis in the smooth ER to other membranes of the cell. But how do the vesicles move about in the cell? Do they just diffuse randomly in the cytoplasm until they happen to hit the right membrane and dock on? Well, no. They are transported to their destinations by motor proteins. But to understand how that works, we need to know a bit more about the interior cytoskeleton of the cell, which is responsible for maintaining or changing cell shape, but also forms transport tracts along which intracellular cargo gets hauled around. The cytoskeleton is made up of three types of protein fibers, the microtubules, the microfilaments, and the intermediate filaments, each of which is shown separately in the fluorescence microscopy images at the top. The microtubules are dyed yellow on the left, the microfilaments in green in the middle, and the intermediate filaments also in green in the image at right. In each case, the nucleus is stained blue, and in the two images at right, the mitochondria have been stained red as well. In these images, the cytoskeletal fibers have been stained individually, but recognize that a cell will contain all three types of cytoskeletal fibers, forming an extensive overlapping network of structural support within the cell. These cytoskeletal fibers are made up of different types of proteins, and they all contribute to the function of maintaining cell shape. But in addition, they're also associated with distinct functions as well. Let's first talk about the intermediate filaments, so named because they're intermediate in size between the microfilaments and microtubules. 
The intermediate filaments are more static in structure and are typically associated with structural support, maintaining cell shape, and tethering cellular organelles in shape. Intermediate filaments are made up of a number of different types of fibrous proteins, keratin, for example, that wind around one another to form strong rope-like fibers. The microfilaments, on the other hand, are made up of globular actin proteins that associate to form fibrous filaments. Microfilaments also contribute to structural support, but they are more dynamic in nature. They can be assembled by adding globular actin at the ends or disassembled by removing actin proteins so they can grow or shrink in size. Changes in the actin filament network can drive overall changes in cell shape and even cell movement. We previously discussed the importance of the microfilament arrays in muscle cell contraction. Microtubules are also made up of globular proteins, but instead of actin, it's tubulin proteins that self-assemble end-to-end to form the wall of a hollow cylinder, hence the name microtubule. As we'll see when we talk about cell division, microtubules are critically important for the transport of copied DNA to daughter cells during cellular reproduction but more generally they function as cellular superhighways along which cellular cargoes like vesicles are moved by motor proteins. There are several different families of motor proteins that have different roles in transport or in cell shape change. And we already talked about myosin motors that facilitate muscle cell contraction. An important family of motor proteins that move cargo along microtubules is the kinesin family. Here's the structure of one of the best characterized kinesin proteins, referred to as conventional kinesin, shown moving a vesicle along a microtubule track. These proteins have microtubule binding domains, shown here in pink, so-called neck linker domains, shown in yellow, a coiled coil domain through which two kinesin polypeptides associate with one another, and cargo binding domains at the end, which here are interacting with the vesicle as cargo. Similar to what happens with myosin motors to drive muscle cell contraction, ATP energy is able to drive a shape change in the kinesin protein, specifically down here in the neck linker region of the protein, that induces movement along the microtubule that looks a bit like walking. We'll watch an animation to see how that works. Here we see a kinesin protein binding to a microtubule via the microtubule binding domain shown in blue, it docks on, and that red region of the protein is the neck linker domain. And you can see the shape change that happens when an ATP molecule binds uh, to that uh, microtubule binding domain. <clears throat> New ATP comes in, that neck linker shape changes, and essentially throws that back foot, or microtubule binding domain, forward. And so in this way, with each ATP that binds and is then hydrolyzed, the kinesin takes one step down the microtubule. It's important to recognize that this is happening at a much faster pace in cells. These kinesins are thought to take around 100 steps per second in cells, and each step requires the hydrolysis of one cellular ATP molecule. So as you can see, the energy used just for cellular transport is enormous. Looking at a typical cartoon blobby diagram of a cell, you might think to yourself, why spend all that energy? Why not just let the vesicles diffuse through all that empty aqueous solution until they eventually hit their target? Save your ATP, right? Well, the truth is that the cell cytoplasm looks nothing like typically depicted in cartoon form in a textbook. It's a noisy, incredibly crowded place, chock full of different types of small molecules, proteins, ribosomes, cytoskeletal fibers, and so on. Here's what an actual cell cytoplasm looks like. What we're looking at in this image is a view of a pancreatic cell specialized to synthesize and secrete the protein hormone insulin, so it has a very well-developed endomembrane system. This is a real electron microscopy image of a real cell, not a cartoon diagram. The image has been false colored to highlight the different organelles and structures. Here in the center are the seven cisternae or compartments of the Golgi complex in light blue, pink, cherry red, green, dark blue, gold, and bright red. Around the Golgi, in yellow on all sides, is the endoplasmic reticulum. 
we can see some membrane-bound ribosomes in blue. And all these orange speckles out here are free cytoplasmic ribosomes, not associated with the rough ER. Different types of vesicles are shown in purple, bright blue, white, and red. Microtubules are here in green, and these big green blobs are actually mitochondria. So what do we learn from this? The cytoplasm is less like a watery solution and more like a dense gel filled with stuff. If you were going to rely on diffusion to move cargo around in this mess, you'd be waiting a long time for anything to get anywhere. Here's another animation from the folks at Harvard BioVisions to really drive home how crowded the cellular cytoplasm is and the role of motor proteins in moving vesicles, organelles, and other materials around in that environment in a directed fashion. In cells, like these neurons, proteins are constantly synthesized, and any misfolding could lead to protein aggregation. The persistence of non-functional protein aggregates in neurons has been associated with many diseases. Proteins are molecular workhorses of the cell. They have many roles, including the assembly of intracellular structural support and molecular motors, or the catalysis of biochemical reactions. The functions of proteins depend on their specific three-dimensional folding and stability in the cellular environment. Proteins occupy up to 40% of the cytoplasmic volume, creating a molecular crowding that increases the risk of protein aggregation between hydrophobic patches in unfolded regions of proteins. Targeted degradation by proteasomes normally limits the consequences of protein aggregation. Not all proteins diffuse freely. freely. Vesicles transport to their final destination secreted proteins, membrane proteins, and proteins targeted to intracellular organelles. For example, vesicles destined to, destined to late endosomes are formed at the surface of Golgi stacks. With the help of clathrin molecules that assemble into a coat, promoting the curvature of the Golgi membrane. Shortly after their release, the vesicles shed their clathrin coat and adapter proteins. Synaptic vesicles undertake a long journey along axons. To overcome limited diffusion caused by molecular crowding, motor proteins transport vesicles on long fibrous proteins called microtubules. Few kinesin motors move each synaptic vesicle toward the plus end of microtubules. Free kinesin adopts an inactive folded conformation. Upon binding with the vesicle, the kinesin stalk region unfolds and the two kinesin heads are free to interact with the microtubule. The ATP-dependent switch between microtubule-bound and free states leads to the alternating swing of the heads that characterizes the hand-over-hand -hand walk of kinesin. Conformational changes and electrostatic steering promote unidirectional movements of vesicles. At any given time, one kinesin head is attached to a microtubule thus favoring long-range, uninterrupted vesicle transport. If a vesicle detaches, its very limited diffusion increases the probability for fast reattachment. In the crowded environment of the cell, mutations altering protein folding increase the risk of aggregate accumulations, which play a key role in the pathogenesis of many neurodegenerative diseases. The last thing I want to talk a bit about is the evolution of eukaryotic cells. And to think about how complex cells with all of this compartmentalization and specialization arose. 
Well, if we think about it, it's not too hard to see how infoldings or invaginations of the plasma membrane could form small subcellular compartments. And if we think in evolutionary terms, we can definitely see that there might be an advantage to having the cell's DNA housed within a membranous compartment, protected from the rest of the cytoplasm, allowing new forms of regulation and control to become possible. And bacteria do exist, for example, the aquatic planktomycetes, that contain a primitive nuclear-like membrane surrounding their supercoiled DNA, with structures that even resemble something like primitive nuclear pores. And we could hypothesize similar advantages for the specialization of other compartments in the endomembrane system as well, corralling potentially destructive hydrolase reactions within the lysosome, away from the rest of the cytoplasm, for example. But the mitochondria and chloroplasts are special organelles with their own unique evolutionary history, and we should spend some time discussing that history. Beginning in the late 19th century, scientists began to hypothesize that these two organelles might have arisen from endosymbiotic events, and evidence in support of this hypothesis really started to accumulate in the 1960s, beginning with the work of evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis. The term symbiosis refers to a mutually beneficial relationship that exists between two separate organisms. Endosymbiosis describes a relationship in which one cell or organism has engulfed another. In other words, maybe a cell has eaten another cell, but instead of breaking that cell down to obtain energy or organic building blocks, the engulfed cell is maintained within the larger host cell, and both cells then derive some mutual benefit from that arrangement. Incidentally, this is not at all rare. This happens a lot. In the case of chloroplasts and mitochondria, the thinking goes that mitochondria are extremely similar to aerobic bacteria, like the alpha proteobacteria, both in their structure and in their metabolism, and the ability to use the oxidizing power of oxygen to synthesize ATP. Chloroplasts, likewise, are extremely similar to cyanobacteria in their structure and in their ability to carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. So the idea is that in the first endosymbiotic event, a large prokaryotic or quasi-eukaryotic cell with some membranous infoldings engulfed a proteobacteria, which became an endosymbiont, the larger cell deriving the benefit of energetic ATP molecules that might leak out of the aerobic proteobacterium, and the proteobacterium enjoying the sheltered protection of the larger cell, as well as a steady supply of organic compound nutrients it supplied. This would be the early eukaryotic progenitor of animal, fungal, and protozoan cells. A second endosymbiotic event involving the acquisition of photosynthetic cyanobacteria in similar fashion would have been the ancient ancestor to the plants and algae. Over thousands and thousands of generations, these engulfed cells would have become obligate endosymbionts, relying so much on the host cell that they could no longer survive outside it and eventually became subcellular organelles, with many essential functions now being derived from the host cell nucleus's genetic instructions. Okay, so that's a nice story, but what evidence is there to support it? Well, it turns out that there's now a lot of molecular evidence to show that this is exactly how these organelles came to exist. We'll just discuss a few key points. First, and maybe most trivially, in both size and structure, both organelles are really similar to the proteobacteria and cyanobacteria they are descended from. They both have a highly convoluted membrane structure that reflects the fact that the critical energy transformation reactions are carried out by membrane-embedded proteins, and the highly folded membrane maximizes surface area and therefore energy transformation processes that occur. These organelles also have their own small genomes, which, like prokaryotic chromosomes, are circular and supercoiled. Like the nucleus, they also have a double membrane structure, but unlike the nucleus, if you examine the specific types of membrane phospholipids that the inner mitochondrial and chloroplast membranes contain, what you find are lipids that are commonly found in bacteria, but not eukaryotic cell membranes. These two organelles are capable of dividing and producing more mitochondria and chloroplasts, even if the cell as a whole is not dividing. And the way that they divide through binary fission is the same way that prokaryotic but not eukaryotic cells divide. These organelles also have their own ribosomes, and by now you should be getting the theme. What do you predict those ribosomes resemble? 
the larger ADS eukaryotic ribosomes like we'd see in the cytoplasm, or smaller 70S ribosomes like those in bacteria. Yep, you've got it. Mitochondrial and chloroplast ribosomes are the smaller prokaryotic 70S type. Some organisms even have chloroplasts that still retain remnants of the peptidoglycan cell wall. The list could go on. The take-home message here is that there is a lot of molecular evidence to support the endosymbiotic theory of the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts as cellular organelles, and nearly all scientists accept it as established fact. In this video, we began with an overview of the evolutionary history of cellular life in the domains bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. We then got a brief introduction to some of the commonly observed cellular structures and features of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We discussed the importance of the endomembrane system in trafficking protein and membrane materials throughout the eukaryotic cell and saw the critical role that motor proteins have in that process. And we end back where we started, thinking about cells from an evolutionary perspective and the endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts. In the next video, we turn our attention to cellular membranes to investigate their structure and function in more depth.